Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of We're Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for today or tomorrow or Wednesday or Saturday or Friday, but just whenever, because after all, it is your podcast. Now, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was graced, um, I was, I was graced by the presence of the rather wonderful, um, Isaac Vega from Plaid Hat Games or Plaid Hat, you know, tomato, tomato. And, but we've kind of gone one further because, um, I'm joined, I'm joined today by a man who I've already said to him off the show, but he's responsible for pretty much getting my kids kind of interested in the hobby. Um, he's a gentleman who has moved from, I guess, um, little rodents with swords to, um, little stuffed things fighting against nightmares and now he's on a journey through into the subconscious mind itself. I am joined by the rather wonderful, the rather fantastic Jerry Hawthorne from from Plat Hat Games. So hello sir. How are you? Hello. Thanks for having me. That's I yeah, I'm delighted. You know, this is like it's like it's Christmas again. It's just it can't get any kind of better better than that. Um, for people who haven't listened to the show before, the reason that we do this is quite simple, is um, we just like to speak to people from various parts in the hobby, be they designers, developers, artists. And the other reason that we like to do this is because Isaac said, you can maybe get Jerry on the show. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so I dropped him an email and he said, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> quite excited by that. Um I guess the first thing um, to touch on is kind of we like to find out a little bit about how you got into the hobby kind of in the first place. So do you want to maybe want to touch on kind of that a bit about how you kind of first got involved? Sure. I can go through my little uh, origin story there of how I got into it. <laughs> um, first of all, I've been a, a board gamer my whole life, uh, an mm. RPG gamer pretty much my whole life. When I was a kid, at a really young age, my older brother was um, – very much into the sort of uh, war games with the hexagons and the little cardboard chips and stuff like squad leader and, uh-huh. you know, all these old uh, world war two era um, strategy games and stuff. And he uh, basically taught me and my younger brother when we were young, how to play those games that so he would have somebody to play against. And uh-huh. um, so I was sort of raised on squad leader and crescendo of doom and, um, and then Starfleet battles have you ever played right. Starfleet Battles? I've heard of it, but I've not I've not played it myself. It's kind but... of old school, uh, complex simulation style hex mm-hmm. hex grid games. Um, so I guess I, um, you know, just that bonding experience with my older brother. Uh, I I was sold from a very young age on on that experience, and uh, so then I've I've always played board games. My fa- I come from a board game playing family, and um, but later on. Uh, I got into um, Dungeons and Dragons and other RPGs, and I just uh, mm. I love that sort of imaginative kind of play. Yeah, um, I love crafting stories, and uh, and I love always love being a, a, a dungeon master or a game master on any of those systems and stuff. And then um, when I became a father, when I when I found out my wife was pregnant and I was going to have a son, yeah, um, I really wanted. I really wanted to introduce him to some of the games that I sort of grew up on and stuff. And I started looking around for games and for, for young kids or for to games that would like bring children into, into our style of gaming, more hobby yeah, style of yeah, gaming. Yeah. And um, I ran across this game that um, was about to be released by Hasbro called Heroescape. And um, that, are you, 
rings Are you a familiar bell, with yeah. that one? Yeah, no, that definitely rings a bell, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, it was a big, uh, awesome strategy board game disguised as a toy, pretty much. <laughs> And, um, and so I really, really, I, I mean, I fell in love with the game. I bought two copies, one for each of my nephews and my son hadn't mm-hmm. been born yet. And, um, and then, uh, there, uh, I was always looking around for information about the game prior to it being released. And I found yeah, yeah. Uh, a website popped up one day. And so, um, it was, a uh, like the best friend of the, one of the guys that designed the game HeroScape had put together, a a little website, uh, you know, community forum, a little community fan website. All right. And uh, just to kind of support his friend who was a board game designer. And I stumbled ac- upon that website when it first popped up and I joined the forums. I was one of the first three or four people on the forums. <laughs> and I, I actually got to meet over the internet. I got to meet the designer, Craig Van Ness and Rob wow. Davio and um, struck up a rapport with them. And they, uh, the, Craig Van Ness gave me his email and asked me to, when I played it with my nephews, uh, to like send him an email and let him know how it goes. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. And so that's basically what I did. I wrote him this long email about uh, all my observations of and all the fun I had playing that game with my nephews, and uh, and then he responded and he said, "Keep them coming," you know. And so I did. And then he he fairly soon after that asked me to become a play tester. Wow. And so I started playtesting for Hasbro and the game became real popular there for a little while. And uh-huh. um, so they they ended up hiring me and um, and a colleague of mine to actually design the the little figures to go into the game. And That's so amazing. we were uh, we were they sometimes they would just give us a name. Sometimes they would give us a name and a little sketch of what they wanted the abilities to be like and stuff. But yeah. it was our job to to just put them through the put them through the test. So I guess uh, being a content developer was my first experience uh, as a professional in, in the world of board game design. Was it kind of, was it kind of cool to be kind of like um, getting directly involved in something that you picked off the shelf? Cause normally I guess in any other hobby, you don't usually have a direct effect or an influence on that product. I mean, you wouldn't like go and buy a VCR and then go on a forum and end up kind of like speaking directly to like maybe the design design <laughs> manner of the manufacturer. You know, you say, well, actually, I like you know, have you thought about front loading instead of top loading, um, <laughs> Mister Sony? But I get you know, um, I, I didn't know. You know, I was I always I guess um, when I was growing up with the type of toys. I mean, you're talking like your buckaroos and everything of like this. And I, mean, I only got into kind of like. Um, Milton Bradley did a massive, um, beautiful range of board games when I was growing up, like Lost Valley of the Dinosaurs, mm-hmm. and they did Hotel as well, um, and obviously Escape from Atlantis yeah. as well. That you know that, um, and those those are the kind of games that got me involved in the board. I didn't realize at the time with you saying what you said that you were actually directly involved. Was that kind of cool? Did you kind of was did that kind of can it was that kind of it must have been quite cool to like know that you were affecting things that you were having an influence and stuff yeah i mean it was supremely cool um it was surreal in fact to yeah. think that to walk into walmart and see the stuff on the shelves that i had worked on you know um that was really really quite something it was very a very big source of pride for me um and then not only that but you know to be a lifelong a board game enthusiast to actually be yeah. doing something behind the curtain um, was really cool. I had done a, I'd done a little bit of play testing on a mm-hmm. few game systems prior to that. So it wasn't like I hadn't gotten my foot kind of in the door. Yeah, um, yeah. And I was always a natural tinker. So um, I don't know if you remember this Milton Bradley game called Hero Quest, but um, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's like one of my <laughs> most favorite games of all time. And so yeah. I, I created tons of content for that. And back when we used to send things through the regular mail, we would yeah. you know, make our own expansions and then print them off and send them to each other in the mail and stuff. Did you get the box that had the actual dungeon design kind of quest? Because they got to the point where they released like Keller's, is it Keller's Keep? And they released like the Ogre Against the Ogre Horde. But then they came out with the actual Adventurer's Toolkit, which had a pad of stickers on it and it was just like a blank grid you remember the grid kind of um, sure, campaigns yeah. you know and you had stickers on that did you get that or were you just like 
They didn't have. Gordon I don't think Freeman. that was a U.S. release. That was a European release, wow. along with the Ogre Horde. Yeah, uh, the Wizards of Morcar, uh, uh, Ogre Horde, the Adventures Design Kit. Those are all European releases. What did you guys get in the states then? We got uh, we got Keller's Keep, the Witch uh-huh. Lord, and we also got the Barbarian and the Elf uh, expansion. Wow, I've never ever seen. I've actually had him. I've actually had in my collection. The other ones, the Wizard of Morcar, the O against the Ogre Horde. I've never seen the Elf or the Barbarian expansions. In fact, I didn't know they existed until before you took it. Oh wow! Kind of told, yeah. Oh. I mean, it was. Well, you see, yeah. here, here's the thing. What you know, I have all of that stuff. I actually have uh, the Elf and the Barbarian uh, still in the shrink wrap. So really, yes. But uh, so my collection is is beautiful. But um, my U.S. collection. But one thing that is very, very special about me is that I also got to meet Stephen Baker um, because of my ties to Hasbro. I got to meet Stephen Baker, yeah. who yeah. is, uh, you know, the, the guy that basically designed Hero Quest. Mm-hmm. And um, but I also got to meet a lot of the people that actually worked on Hero Quest back when it was in print. And I've got to I, I have I've gotten to see some of the um, the unreleased material. Now you know you're just I'm, showing off. Now you're just showing off. <laughs> <laughs> I actually ha- I actually know what they were going to release, but they never did. I know that information. And, I just uh, I just wonder if Hero Quest had kind of been released because I think what happened is it kind of got released, and then people seemed to jump from Hero Quest, and then there was Space Crusade, uh-huh. but then Games Workshop kind of played a blinder at that time and kind of sneaked in and went, "Oh, do you like little plastic miniatures and dice?" Well. You know, Advance Hero kind of Advance Hero Quest came out, mm-hmm. and there was Hero Quest Advanced, <laughs> which was kind of like had the Men at Arms kind of expansion in it. But then there yeah. was Advanced, obviously Advance Hero Quest, Advance Hero Space Crusade, and then Games Workshop kind of came in and started releasing magazines to say, okay, here's some additional expansions, and that took people into your kind of like your Warhammer kind of forty thousand and stuff like that. That's so, right. I mean, with, I mean, did you, what was your kind of your next steps after here? I mean, how long did you continue to, to work alongside the guys when they were doing a Heroes game? Then? We did that um, from 2005 all the way through to like 2009. Wow. In 2009, see, they had, um, they had uh, given the license uh, uh, over to one of their subsidiaries. And so we were working uh-huh. for Wizards of the Coast. Doing a Dungeons and Dragons okay. version of um, yeah. of Hero Quest, and um, and so that I did. I was part of the team that did the Dungeons and Dragons version, and okay. then um, yeah, and that was about when it when they started uh, you know phasing it out, and uh, that was about the same time that I started working on Mice and Mystics in you know, or yeah, in two thousand nine, I was working on Mice and Mystics on my own and. Um, a friend of mine that would, had worked at Hasbro with me, Colby Dalk, he's, he's my studio manager here at Planet yeah. Games, but yeah. he, he, uh, he went and spun off and started his own game company and launched um, Summoner Wars, um, which is Plaid Hat's first game. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, that was sort of my connection and how I got uh, Mice and Mystics published. Through him. Where's the idea? I mean, you can't, when you were talking earlier on, you were talking about kind of like your son, you know, coming into the world was was Mice and Mystics almost like your version of Hero Quest for him when you yeah. kind of first started designing it. I started designing it um because my daughter was had was struggling to learn how to read. And, All right, um, okay. and I had this uh, audacious idea that I would uh that I would help her learn how to read uh by creating a game where you could do a little bit of reading and then play a little bit of activity. And then, so I could Mm -hmm. break the reading up into little smaller chunks Mm -hmm. um, and break it up with an activity like gameplay because she would get uh, real fidgety when she was trying to read. And so she would get, she, she would need to like take frequent breaks. And so I thought that would be uh, a neat idea to come up with a game. And she was really into mice and I was really into hero quest. So I basically (laughs) made a a mouth version of a hero quest. I have a sword. There you go. Have a, have a sword. <laughs> was it difficult to get the mice to hold the swords? Did you have to tie it? 
tie yeah, it back on when we to were using real mice, it was really tough. <laughs> <laughs> really tough. That must have been a difficult pitch to Colby. <laughs> you were like saying, well, how do you ship these? Why have, why have the boxes got holes in them? <laughs> it's like, oh, no, no, wait. This is the USP. <laughs> and why why are we not pitching these to Walmart? Why are we pitching these to pets at home? Just watch this. <laughs> yeah, pet stores. <laughs> pet stores are buying them up with large amounts. No. Um, because one of the striking things about, like, it, for me, it was that whole attraction of the fact that this was generally the flavor text is called the flavor text because it's the flavor text. It gives you the reason why your character looks a certain way. For Mice and Mystics, um, and I said this off, off kind of episode to you, um, was one of the first games that, you know, my, me and my kids kind of enjoyed playing together. And one of the things was, was, that it was kind of interwoven, that the story was equally as important to kind of play in the game, which kind of gave it that additional magical quality. And it also meant it wasn't necessarily going to be a dark, you know, as a dark game, it was obviously meant to be something that you enjoyed. It also meant it also pushed you on to wanting to play kind of like the next chapter as well. Was that kind of in your thinking as well, was to, to have kind of like encouragement there to kind of keep, I guess, your daughter interested in kind of moving on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it sort of took on a life of its own. Um, we, um, at the time, we, we didn't know that my daughter had um, a learning difference. And so we had taken her to a neurologist and um, mm-hmm. they basically, you know, told me that she had a visual processing disorder that's very similar to dyslexia and that mm-hmm. really no amount of, no amount of board game design was really going to help her with that. Yeah. We ended up having to have her, uh, some special glasses made for her and stuff, you know, and even to this day, she still struggles a little bit with reading. Um, Mm -hmm. and her eyes just don't track, um, smoothly. So it makes reading really hard. She misses words and letters. Um, but the game had sort of taken on a life of its own. And, and I had discovered within me a passion for writing the story and I had, I'd gotten the story all fleshed out in my mind and it was something I just really needed to express. And for me, since I'm not a writer, I'm more into board games as a hobby. And and at that time Mm -hmm. I was actually doing a a lot of stuff professionally in the board game world. It just was a natural fit for me to express myself through the language of board games. And um, so I, for me, when I was, when I was fully rendering out my, my idea for, for my, uh, for my some mystics, I really wanted to create a game um, that delivered on the story because that was the thing that I really like most about uh, playing role playing games and, and yeah. adventure games and stuff is I really like to have that little bit of story that little I love the way that in Hero Quest every mission was different and it matched whatever theme of the little story that you're on you know every yeah, quest yeah. was a little bit different and I love that how they they use the same components but they they recycled everything so cleverly that you always felt like it was a fresh a uh, new chapter in the story. And so that's mm. where I went with Mice and Mystics, where I wanted it to feel that very same way, but even taken to a, a, a bigger degree, not shying away from the story. Was there, there's a, one of the things that, um, that I noticed about Mice and Mystics is that there was mechanics that were in that were like, say, single use kind of mechanics for some of the, some of the parts of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, was there a lot of stuff that you had to reduce and strip out as yeah, you went I mean, through it? Did you? One of the big challenges of designing a, a game that tells a story is that mm-hmm. you you find yourself extremely confined by the actual mechanics of the game itself, and you're mm-hmm. trying to tell this story, and you're like, "Oh, there's a big action sequence, or this is a big romantic sequence, or whatever," and you realize that the that the game mechanics don't. They don't support all of that. And so what I did with Mice and Mystics, sort of a ham-fisted kind of way, is I, you know, if you were on a page that had a special rule, I'd put a special rule there, and then you would have to just use that rule for that one special page. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, one of the one of the things, the connections that I didn't make is if, if I'm going to do that, if I'm going to write these special rules for these special situations, then I should probably make the core rules, you know, quite a bit more streamlined so that you don't also have to remember those. And the, 
that there were some areas of the rule book ha that had little rules in there that you didn't use very often. So you'd forget them and you'd have to look them up in the rule book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was why I took a different approach with stuff. Fables where the rule book is very small. You read it uh -huh. once. You don't really have to go back and look up yeah. that much stuff. Um, because the core mechanics are just very, very, very flexible. And then, yeah. Yeah. And then if I need to put any uh, special rules in, I can either put it on the page or I can, you know, have a little card that, you know, oh, whenever we encounter water, then we put the water card out, you know, and that way you don't have to clog up the, the book with it. And, uh, it, you know, if it's an edge case and it just happens every once in a while, you just throw the card out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, were you surprised about the reception that Mice and Mystics received? Because at the uh, time, I mean, anybody you mention it to, they go, yes, it's absolutely beautiful. The clock, the slices of cheese, even the miniatures, everything. It's a beautiful kind of looking game. Were you kind of quietly confident when it was going out there that this was going to be kind no, of... I mean no, I think I was pr more naive than anything. Like, uh, mm. I didn't have the, I don't, I mean, I don't, I didn't even have the fear and reservations that I have nowadays, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, mm. it was, I guess I was just sort of innocent and I'm like, wow, I'm making a board game, you know? <laughs> um, and I spent countless hours working on it. Um, those are, you know, those are moments that I'll never, I'll never, ever forget. I mean, I, I remember, I I got I bought this yellow, um, this yellow resin that that was like clay that you could do whatever mm -hmm. you wanted with it, and then you baked it in the oven, and it would get yeah. hard, and yeah. it was yellow. So I had a rolling pin. I rolled out this stuff really thin, and then I took a cookie cutter, a round cookie cutter, and I cut out these round shapes, and I cut them like a pizza into little cheese wedges. Yeah. And I took the I took the back end of a of a paintbrush, and I made little little dots. Yeah in the cheese and I baked it in the oven. And then I realized that in, in, in my effort to make this cheese, I was creating cheese wheels, right? Yeah. 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 No, it sounds dumb, but at that time I hadn't cheese. The cheese wheel wasn't a mechanic in the game yet. <laughs> and I realized that there, that, that, that six, six cheese wedges, you know, makes a perfect wheel. And then I was like, yeah. well, this could be a timer in the game that I could use it for a lot of different things. I yeah, could have yeah, this, yeah. this cheese wheel fill up. And so, I mean, that was just, just, happenstance that 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 happened but, but things sometimes like really... click to place you know so things like do just happen or click into place sometimes it's like i'll speak to a lot of people and they'll just say so what how did you come up with that mechanic it's just i don't know it kind of happened <laughs> but it kind of worked at the time it's like the other thing was the initiative track now if obviously oh, that comes from now you know at the time, my kids thought this was a magical thing, and it's like they also thought sometimes it was a pain because they thought, well, all of a sudden we're going to have to face like three rats and <laughs> an centipede yeah. before they can actually get the turn. But obviously, that's from your the kind of the D and D days, kind of you know the old kind of roll, roll to initiative. Um, <clears throat> how I mean, how long after? Because my and Mystics had <clears throat> the expansions. Mm -hmm. And then there was, um, then there was, is it tail feather? So yeah, what I mean, what made you decide to go down kind of that route? Because that's obviously completely, again, kind of completely different. Was that looking at kind of like obviously there was the X wings of the time and wings of war? Were you looking to kind of do something along that ilk, or was it? Sure, just something. I, mean, I, I like those kinds of games. Um, mm -hmm. That when I started designing tail feathers. Um, I didn't really have, um, I wasn't trying to make X-Wing or, or Wings mm -hmm. of War or anything, but I really wanted to have a flying game and I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to do something different. You know, I like, I mean, I like doing stuff that is just different and I don't know. Um, nobody had ever done birds before and I had this no. idea of this tilt mechanic, which I thought was really cool. So you could sort of. You know, if you're going to tilt one way, then that's the way that you fly. And that mm -hmm. that visual, um, as you're playing the game of tail feathers, it's really cool because it like uh, anybody who walks by the table and sees all these birds flying around and all these trees and all these, you know, critters running around on the branches of the trees, they immediately see like a, a 
a still frame from a big action, you know, big epic action scene, you know. I really love that. Um, it's kind of like, to me, it's like a, a, a form of art where you're creating this, these, this little vignette of, a, of, a, of an action scene. And you also know exactly what you're getting when you look at the game. If you're standing over the table, yeah. then you can instantly get a snapshot and it can help you make a decision. It kind of it draws you in to say, wow, I want to actually see how this all ties in together and how all the mechanics on this on this kind of works as well. Um, I mean, in terms of with um, Plata, I mean, when Mice and Mystics came around, did, did, uh, did Colby just bring you in then and just say, okay, you're now, you're involved in the company? Or, because when I spoke to Isaac, he said he was in as a while on, like, almost like a freelance basis, and then he was brought in as kind of like... Um, an employee was that the same thing as yourself or did or were you in at Plata pretty much quite early on after kind of summon awards kind of came about well um colby the um the you know the 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 head guy at plat hat games he um i mean he's a friend of mine so uh oh. <laughs> so we were you know we were we were pretty close and mm. um so like you know, he, he would, we would talk about, um, stuff and he, I mean, I, I was, uh, I was just a part, he was a part of my life. I was a part of his life. And, and yeah. so was Plata Games. Um, and yes, I did do, uh, I did do freelance work, uh, as far as Mice and Mystics is concerned yeah. that, um, you know, that was a, a royalty paid kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and everything else that I did, up until about two years ago was all freelance stuff. But there's uh -huh. also lots of stuff I did that, that weren't even like, uh, that, that contributed to the company, but that weren't even, even like a paid sort of thing, you know, just, yeah. Just being involved and being a fan of Plat Hat games while at the same time contributing to their success. is basically what, what I've done since the beginning of the company and long, and even before then. Uh -huh. But as of, as of two years ago, I've been working full time for Plat Hat games. And that was um, my first game with them uh, full time was Stuffed Fables. Where did you get the idea for Stuffed Fables? Was it the kind of was it almost like an evolution of what you what you did next with mice? Because not being funny, but the way that Mice and Mystics kind of plays is you were moving from page to page as you were playing it in mm -hmm. order to digest the rules and everything that was that was there. Stuffed fables seemed to be the case that you were moving. You were you were doing pretty much the same thing, except rather than kind of building up the board of the modular pieces, you were actually just sticking the characters directly on the almost like the the book itself. So is that is that where it came about, or how did how did it kind of evolve? Oh, I um, I mean, I really wanted to make a game that had had the ability to have a, a wide variety of, uh, of locations where you're, where you find your characters at. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, getting tired of the, of the limitations of having, you know, board pieces and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. getting tired of that limitation. I wanted a game where I could tell a dynamic story. Um, and so I had this idea that I could have a, a book of maps and, and then I could have another book that would be where all the stories kept. Mm -hmm. And I uh, had this really cool idea. I came and I, I pitched the idea to, uh, Col to Colby, my boss. And mm -hmm. his first thing out of his mouth is like, why two separate books? Why not just put them together into one book? <laughs> That's what I would like to see. Put them together into one book. And I'm like, oh, boy. And that created a whole bunch of new challenges yeah. to figure out. But... I mean, I'm up. I'm up to those kinds of challenges. Uh, I thought it was a compelling challenge. Like, if we could do this, this would be something new and different. And so, um, I immediately started uh, sort of redesigning the game so that it could work inside of a book. And um, and it just, for some reason, it just came flowing out of me. You know, it just this idea really works. These are the concessions that I have to make to do it, but this, but this yeah. is really working. You get all these other benefits of just having everything self-contained in this book. And the, it's neat, the fog of war effect that you get from not knowing what's coming on the next page and everything. To watch yeah, little yeah. kids, to watch their anticipation as, 
moms turning the page to the to the new you know to wherever they're going and they don't know what they're gonna encounter when they get there and then they see and they're just trying to <laughs> they're trying to decode what's going to happen that kind of interest it just watching that observing that with children it it's an amazing thing you know but i mean you say mention children but i mean i mean one of the the fans and outspoken fans that i know is is you know is andy lewis from polyhedron collider Mm -hmm. I mean, he just loves stuff, fables. He goes on about it all the time. He's not, he's not a kid, <laughs> and he's not got, well, you know. I, I so he's like, not got kids. If you if you create a game that can give adults that childlike feeling too, um, yeah. It, for for a lot of adults like myself, it, it's it's a it's a good feeling. It's a it's a really really warm wholesome feeling. And so yes, I I totally understand what he's talking about because I I like all that stuff too. Um, yeah, yeah. And I love the idea. I'm like extremely proud of the idea, this concept that I'm helping create, you know, tomorrow's board game fans, you know, to I'm I'm helping create this new generation of of youngsters who are going to grow up and have board gaming is going to be an interest of theirs because they they got introduced to it as a child and those those indelible memories that my games create um will be with them for their lives, you know. And in terms of like the actual look and feel, I mean, because Stuffed Fables looks, it's a stunning looking game. And every, it must be every, at least every month, there'll be a post in some kind of Facebook group to say, here's, I got Stuffed Fables last month. Here's all, here's all the figures all kind of painted up. Um, I mean, did you have, did you work quite closely in terms of the art and the design of the figures and the characters that were involved? To yes, you know. but like, uh, but I'm I, I'm at Plat Hat Games where we have Isaac Vega, who is you know, <laughs> he's like our creative art director kind of guy. His brother Sam, art direction yeah. and stuff. So, like, when you look at stuff, fables, and you see how everything looks, yeah, you you have to understand that. This is my vision mixed with Sam's vision, mixed with Isaac's vision, mixed with our graphic designers. Um, yeah. Isaac uh, found this wonderful artist who did the art, this Pauline um, that did the art for Stuff Fables and created mm -hmm. the, the look of those little stuffed animals and stuff. You know, she, mm -hmm. she has this unique style to her art that just makes everything feel so lived in, you know. Um, the, the color coordination between the artist's um, and the graphic art design team, you know, that co color coordination is why you have that. You you look at it and you see this beautiful artistic package that's all all together. The cover of the box, Isaac sketched that out himself and created that look of the cover of the box and had Pauline, the artist, uh, render it out. You know, um, like all this stuff is like a big team effort. So, uh, as much as I, you know, would love to take credit for all of that. Most of that stuff it had had little to do with me um, because everybody everybody gets involved in a project like this, and that's when they get really good is when everybody's involved, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you think that's helped in general kind of make Plaid Hat kind of the company that people kind of keep going back to and picking back, picking up the older titles? We picking have... back the older stuff that you've got because you've got a very, very loyal fan base and as I think I said to Isaac, if I go down the list of games that you've made, you're not like you're not like the cool mini or not kind of game. Where you're just doing miniature games. I mean, if I look down, you've got things like Specter Ops, then you've got Summoner Wars, then you've got Ashes, you know, then you've got City of Remnants, then you've got Mice and Mystics. They're kind of maybe genres that maybe a company would tackle the same genre again and again and again. And do you think that's maybe part of the six, the continued kind of success? Maybe. I mean, I, I think that there's a few things that we're that we're known for. Mm. Um, number one is that we're we're all very visual, so we want mm. our games to have a certain look to them. We mm. want them to like have that when they're on the table and they're all laid out. We want them to have that visual appeal. So that it looks like you like like for instance with mice and mystics, I I was adamant that I wanted it to look as if the little mice were like playing on the artwork. I didn't want to have a bunch of grids and lines. You know, I wanted yeah. it to feel yeah. like very organic. 
And these these decisions that we make, we're we make them because we're we have this art, artistic calling, I think, you know, this creative calling. And we have a mm-hmm. boss who uh, he instead of like squelching that he fosters that. And um, that means that we're always taking risks here and we're always taking risks there and we're always trying new things and pushing, uh, you know, pushing the edges of what uh, what has been done before and what can be done with board games. And um, all of our games always have a lot of very rich storytelling and world building to them as well. So I think those are the things that our fans uh, are attracted to. Yeah. A lot yeah. of them have the same, have the same kind of uh, board game sensibilities as we do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I don't mean to kind of like be the kind of the sycophantic blowing smoke up your butt kind of guy, but it's like when you go on and if you look at the stuff that you guys are continually kind of pushing out, it's really, really kind of high quality and people seem to really kind of, enjoy the games but it also seems to be like say like stuffed fables it's kind of constantly in the background there's always somebody picking it up there's always somebody bringing it up there's always somebody mentioning or reference it or doing like a quick playthrough or a quick review whereas what i see in the in the kickstarter world is that you get you know loud noises and then it just kind of shrinks away and i think that's testament to kind of what what you're doing um, with moving on to say like Comanauts it see I mean are you okay my connection to the question is you've got Jet you've got um, obviously the is it Gen 7 which was connected to kind of the uh, which is which is um, <clears throat> sorry you got Gen 7 which was using the Crossroads system mm-hmm. yeah and then, which for Dead of Winter, you then obviously got Stuffed Fables, which is some tie in with almost like a similar system to kind of Comanots. Was that what you're, what you were thinking? Were you thinking when you're wanting to do something different with, you yeah, obviously had a really good system with Stuffed Fables. So was that your kind of your idea to say, well, can I do something different using the similar kind of base, kind of mechanic kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, the, the mechanics that, Mm. Um, stuff fables uses those mechanics mm. i created those not for stuff fables i created those actually for comanauts but all right okay yes so um but what happened is um i ran into some uh design limitations in comanauts i couldn't quite bring my vision about and um i also had like some tragedies and stuff happen in my own family and i just didn't really right. feel like writing a story that was so personal like that one. And so I, uh, Mm -hmm. I had a hard time writing that story and, but I had this good set of mechanics that that is is designed to be really flexible. And um, I, when I, when I came up with this idea to have this book of maps and have this other book of stories and my boss wanted me to put them together into one book Mm. I had this story in my mind of these stuffed animals that came to life at night. And I just used the mechanics that I created for Comanauts. I used them for this game and it was a perfect fit uh, because that's what the, that's what that mechanic was designed to do is like to be able to take different stories and tell them um, yeah, and have them yeah. feel, you know, you can manipulate the mechanics here and there and make it feel, you know, harder or easier or, you know, more complex or whatever, but you still have this core set of mechanics. It's very flexible. You could tell lots of different kinds of stories. And mm-hmm. so that's how mm-hmm. Stuff Fables came about, was basically right. taking taking a break from writing Comanauts. Yeah, okay. Um, and then after Stuff after Stuff Fables hit the market, um, or yeah, after it was done, deciding what my next game was going to be, I had several options, and um, I decided to go ahead and get Comanauts out there because it's a you know it's a it's a very personal story that I wanted to tell. I just wanted to get it out there and you know, make this sort of mark on the world and see how it yeah. does. The idea behind these adventure book games is that we can tell tons of different kinds of stories using the yeah. same kind of concept. I mean, Comanauts hasn't been out that long. No. So a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, a couple of weeks. And I mean, how does it play? I mean, if somebody's been saying, oh, well, I've seen, I've seen, I, I'm trying to imagine Comanauts, Stuffed Fables, 
the similar system on the table, how would it actually play? If I was going to go and pick it up for the first time, what kind of gameplay? How would I play it? What would I expect I'd be playing? I mean, it's is, it more, is, it, is it more grown-up? Is it, it's right? an action-adventure game. So, yeah. But it takes place inside of the uh, fractured mind, imagination of, uh, of this genius who's in a coma. And you're uh-huh. trying to bring him out of the coma by uh, tracking down his inner child and having interactions with his inner child and trying to uh, bring him out mm-hmm. of his coma. You, you find out that he's being, he's being held in his coma by his own inner demons. These are unresolved aspects of his life that have left little scars or traumas uh, on his psyche. Mm-hmm. And you can go in there and uh, release him from their grip by doing battle with those, like a boss in a, in a video game or something, doing mm-hmm. battle with mm-hmm. those and interacting with his inner child and, and getting the information you need to save the world. Um, it's a huge psychedelic trippy action adventure with uh, poignant moments that parallel uh, some of the experiences that most people deal with in real life. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea is that we could, you could go in and, and just in this fantasy wild uh, adventure, you can go in and help somebody rid themselves of these inner demons that are holding them back in life. And that metaphorically is healing for everybody involved, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's, but there's like but, 11, there's like 11 different inner demons and they're all based upon um, just the, the same kind of uh, things that might hold a person back in life. Uh, things, yeah, yeah. You know, moments of trauma from their life, like grief and uh, you know, selfishness and, um, you know, guilt, shame, uh, you know, all these things that, that might hold somebody back in life. Well, you can go in and help and help this coma victim deal with those. And as you're in there, sort of like peeling layers off of an onion, you gradually learn more and more about who he is and what happened to his life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. With it being kind of, I would say, you know, a quite personal project to you, um, have you have a different approach to when you're kind of looking at how the reviews have gone for the game and things like that? Is it is it a bit more of a? I mean, obviously, stuff fables folks say, well, I don't like the way the teddy bear looks, <laughs> kind of thing. You're like, oh, it's a teddy bear, okay, go. But is it a little bit more of a personal project for you that you're kind of going to say, well, I'm, uh, you're a bit more aware of the kind of maybe um, the reception to it? I'm not you know, because it. I'm not really aware of the reception to it yet. So, um, all right, okay. But I haven't, I haven't like seen any reviews or anything. All right. Um, but you know, there's not. I mean, when you put when you put something out there, some people are going to like it, and some people won't. So I don't yeah. know. I, I I don't really know. But what one thing I do know is, as a creator, when you when you go to express yourself, you just you have to you have to be authentic as you as much as you can, and yeah. um, at some point you put your creation out there, and then you just hope for the best. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean. But again, I mean, I guess going on kind of Plaid Hat's reputation, you will get people that will you'll get people that will just go ahead and take the risk and jump in to Coma Knots because it is Plaid Hat, which mm-hmm. is the pedigree that's kind of behind yourself in mm-hmm. terms of um, things like expansions. For both maybe Stuffed Fables and for Comanots, with the format being kind of like the book, um, does that make it easier to consider creating the expansions? Because you maybe have to, it might cost a little bit less to produce the expansions themselves, or is that is that something you're kind of considering for both um, properties? We had originally conceptualized the Adventure Books games as not being expansion driven yeah uh, we feel like the marketplace right now everybody everybody always seems to expect an expansion but yeah. i'm not exactly sure that they are the most financially viable pursuit uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. i'm not that's an area of expertise it's not it's not really up to me but i like to have a boss who who is savvy and knows that stuff and tells me what they want me to deliver. So if my boss comes to me and says, Hey, we really need an expansion for, 
for stuff fables. And I'm, I've already sort of been hearing rumblings of people wanting one. I'm ready. I got the, I, I got ideas up, of, you know, I got ideas all stacked up and ready to go. I have it locked and loaded. If you want some expansion for stuff fables, it's ready to go. Comanauts, just have to press the, press the I don't button. think I'll do another Comanauts because Comanauts was, you know, very, very emotionally draining to actually make. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not a, it's not a, it's not something that I want to just continue on. I really liked, I, I, I like the way that the story is told and it comes to a complete yeah. and total finish. I could see yeah. the idea of like having these Comanauts and they go inside these different people's minds. And I think that would be cool, but yeah. But right now, I think that um, you yeah, we'll just have to see. It and that's it. Yeah, we'll just have yeah. to see. I mean, if 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 like I said, if my boss, I mean, I could see, I could see going into other people's minds. And so, if my boss came to me and said, "Hey, man, the world wants another Comanauts. What do you think?" Then I could have yeah. you know three or four ideas waiting, uh, locked and loaded, and ready to go. But um, but I, you know, Are also, you I'm, I'm working on a project right now, and so my nose is very much down on this project right now my focus is entirely on what i'm working on right now so and is that a departure from kind of stuffed fables the comanauts kind of mechanic thing i mean did you decide your next project i I'm, I'm not doing you know books and characters i'm doing something completely no i'm doing another book done. i'm <laughs> i'm doing another cool. book right now but it's a completely different story completely different right. setting yeah. you know what i'm saying this, yeah, uh, yeah. Like adventure, the adventure book system, like what ha the way that we envisioned it is that you can tell a completely different story each time you release an adventure book. But yeah, you have yeah. you have some of the shared DNA, so people who've played one of them will kind of know how yeah. they play, and so it's easy to yeah, learn yeah. and yeah. easy to easy to uh, pick up and learn. Is that exciting to be kind of be doing something? different but still kind of knowing the foundations behind it you're able to push it out in different directions take different risks with it and things like that well it allows me it allows me to focus on the story not having mm -hmm. to redesign you know the game from the ground all the way up each time but focus on the story although with this one um there's some different mechanics it, it doesn't it's not dice driven like um stuff fables and comanauts mm -hmm. so it's got this different kind of uh different kind of set of mechanics and it's a lot of fun <laughs> i can't talk about it but it's a lot of fun i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fret, you know it's like i get this you can understand i get this a lot you know i've got this fantastic exciting project i cannot tell you a word about it anything at all otherwise i'm gonna get can i say is there a different genre i mean are you is there i mean i'm assuming there is like a book of you know, it's got kind of JH's ideas on it. And is there kind of other stuff that you're thinking about? I mean, have you got a, like a worker placement kind of tucked away? Is there a little part? I mean, I was speaking to Isaac about his corn on the cob party game, but I was wondering, <laughs> I mean, is there... <laughs> I haven't heard you know, of that one. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. Um, is, I... I mean, is there like, is there a find the cheese party game? <laughs> <It is>. No. <laughs> no. No. Um... <laughs> I mean, for me, uh, I, I'm not going to pretend like I'm a worker placement kind of person or, uh, you yeah. know, I'm not going to, I mean, you're not going to see like a heavy Euro or anything coming from me. What I do like are adventure games. I like, I like mm. to transport people, make them, take them completely out of their normal lives and let them have an adventure. Um, and so my games are probably always going to be story-based, adventure-based games um, mm. one way or another. Uh, visually appealing, um, immersive thematic kind of things. Um, so, yeah, you're probably not going to see any sort of Euro games or anything coming out of me. I, I'd play it, though, if you if you put it out there. <laughs> <laughs> if you put it out there, I'd play it. You know, obviously, if Isaac put it out there, I'd be it putting it It probably wouldn't be very shit. good. It probably wouldn't be very good, so you'd be playing I'd, it just for the... You know, it'd be... I would do it anyway, you know, <laughs> just, you know, for the... This. I mean, is there is there a is there a is there games out there? Do you get a lot of time to play yourself? I mean, are you constantly kind of playing kind of board games on a regular basis? Do you have like regular group sessions that yeah, you go to? Yeah, we we have a, a board game night every Tuesday night here at the offices, the Plaid Hat offices, mm. Um, mm. and we have you know friends and outsiders who come in and play games 
Um, we play regular published games from, of ours. We play published games from other companies, but we also play prototypes um, that we're working on too. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. but most of it is just a sort of always leak, like weekly reconnect with our love of board games by playing board games, exploring different other you know other board games out there that that we're that we're interested in. I really like, um, you know, like a, a, I love Above and Below and Near and Far and those kinds yeah. of games. Obviously, since they have story, you know, they got me because I love that. Yeah, um, yeah. But I also like, uh, I, I love that new um, Martin Wallace game, the um, Wildlands. Just yeah, okay. I love, um, really love Gaslands by Osprey Games, the, um, the, the car battling one where you use little Hot Wheels. Yeah, we I've seen, love I've seen, that around I've here. Seen John, I've seen John Gilmore. Yeah. Can, I think he was posting up models he was like putting together and for a while that's all you saw was, you know, I'm get I'm getting my I'm getting my gang together and look, do you think this looks ridiculous? And it's like a, <laughs> you, you know, it's like a Corvette with a dinosaur sellotape to the top of it. Just yeah. For, for yeah additional I love that. kind of attack. Fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> My taste in games tends to be more beer and pretzels kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, I like I like really, really simple mechanics, and you know, I like there to be. I like you to. I like to feel like I'm on an adventure of some kind. Do you do stuff outside the kind of the hobby? I mean, is there? Is I mean, are you a kind of a? Do you go out and do a bit of fishing? Are you a kind of a, you know, a wonderful ice skater? I, I mean, you know. Outside of work, I find that my family keeps me busy. You know, my wife yeah. and kids. The um, my kids are teenagers now. Wow! And um, I I just like to I I, I work out, um, so I like to <laughs> exercise, <laughs> and I love to Long cook. Walks to the beach. <laughs> I cook a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I are love you pina like coladas. the cool- <laughs> are you like the cool dad? Are you no, like the cool I'm dad? Not. Do they vote, like all come round to your house because you're like the board game designer yeah. dad? Other kids kind of like? might say, "Man, that uh, Hawthorne dad is really cool," but my kids don't think I'm cool at all. <laughs> at all. <laughs> you're just like moving cardboard about dad. Why can't you be doing something else, you like being a postman ego. or something? You can't have an ego <laughs> living in my household with my kids. They will tear it down. Just- I come to work just to get just to get to get built back up again. <laughs> so, so what you what you really wanted is if we give out your email address, what you want is people send you just nice emails about how much they like your stuff. No, that, that just doesn't even we, have to be. They don't even. It doesn't have to be adoration at all. Just something nice would be fine. They don't even have to like me. They could be like. I like people like you. I'm not sure who you are. I'm not sure if I like you, but I like people that are like you or something like that. And if, that... if we target this round about Thursday, Friday, so we're kind of building you up for the weekend. Oh, okay, good, yeah. So you've got enough, your level of adoration's up here. So hopefully as your kids strip you down when you get down, down to Monday, yeah. you've still got a slight bit <laughs> of kind of, of self kind of confidence. <laughs> Um, is there? I mean, the games that are coming out just now, obviously, like a game, things like Wingspan and stuff like that. You mm-hmm. know, it's getting. You know, it's coming from nowhere, and um, Elizabeth Hargrave seems to have played a blinder with this game. Everybody's talking about it. There's a lot of kind of kind of buzz going about it as well. Is there games that you're seeing at the moment that you would like to get to the table? yourself that you'd oh, like to sure. can I, get your hands on yes yes um um fantasy flight games has a new lord of the rings game coming out yes later this year that. i really want that i also want their um their new star wars one um about the outer rim, the outer rim. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and uh and i'm friends with Corey kaneska i can't believe i'm I, i'm saying that because i used to be ju- i used to just be a fan of his but now i kind of feel like we're kind of you know we're chums now and so i just love his i love the way his mind works and i'm so happy that and thrilled that i'm able to uh, see him every once in a while and talk to him and, and and also enjoy being a fan of his games 
Um, I love anything by um, Nikki Valens. Um, I love that mm. Legacy of Dragon Hole is a really cool game. I don't know if you played that one. It's all not, story, yeah, dude. No. It's right up my alley. It's all story. <laughs> um, I like playing that solo um, because my, you know, my my family, my kids, my son's into video games, my daughter's into boys, and <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're just. Uh, Sometimes it's it, sometimes I just sit down and I'll play a game alone, you know. I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I have Mage Knight there. I've heard that's a good ready one. Ready to go. I it is meant to be. It's meant to be a good three or four hours of your time, you know. And there's only so much. There's only so much I can get away with with doing nothing in the house. But if I've got this out, I can just say, look, this is complicated. This is something I've got to work with. This is me giving myself some kind of my some kind of me time, um, which is which is fine. Awesome, um, awesome. Is there is there any games you'd like to add to your collection? I mean, I joked with Isaac, um, and he says, "Well, look, I can get hold of anything because we're part, you know, we're part of Asthma Day, so I just have to go like that, and games appear." But is there anything that you would like to see on the shelf in your collection if you could have any kind of games at all you would like to add um i'm not i'm not a person who's all big into acquisition you know yeah so um i don't have like a very big game shelf you know i don't yeah. have i don't actually have a shelf that you, you know that like you see people taking pictures of their game shelves and stuff <laughs> but um but there's there's some cool games coming out there's um there's one uh, that is uh, that involves. It's a dice placement game. The the Reckoners. Have you played this one? Yes, I've heard of it. Yeah, it, yeah. Had, have you played it yet? Been on the show. I've not played it yet, but the guys that did it were on the show. Yeah, it's very, very, very cool. Very interesting. Um, it's it's really mostly just battling, um, and there's a lot of pressure. It's a co-op, and there's a lot of pressure put on. But I, I yeah. just love the way the dice work and everything is just so deluxe and stuff. So that would be a really cool one to own. I think it's just such a, it's such a high quality, you know, product. It's, it's amazing. Um, yeah. You know, I, I got to play root a little while back. I thought that was really neat. Have you played that one? It's, I have got all of the root. Okay. So, I you just, know, <laughs> it's, it's, I, it's yeah, pretty, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's, <clears throat> It's really, it's appealing on many different levels. You know what I'm saying? Like on its innovation, it's appealing. And on its, uh, on the way that it models these different, you know, cultural struggles and stuff, it's really kind of cool. Um, yeah. I love the, the art direction on it. It's amazing. It's just really neat. I like the fact um, when as Patrick was um, talking about there's so many factions out there that aren't there. It's like going back to you talking about kind of Hero Quest again. Is mm -hmm. that he says there's so many factions that we have. Re he has got ready to go oh, good. to add to root because it's you know there's and there's and there's, that's one of these things that the fans have been able to produce kind of their own stuff as well, which is kind that's of neat. fairly, which is fairly fairly kind of cool. Um, there's a game coming out called Tidal Blades. Have you heard of this one? Yes, it was a Kickstarter. I've heard it. I got to play it at PAX U. That's uh, James James Hudson. It's wonderful. Um, it's just wonderful. I've got that coming actually. <laughs> oh, you're gonna love it. I, it, I think it's just I, fantastic. It's uh, I I didn't buy it, but uh, Isaac bought it, so we'll be playing it around here at the at the office. So it's that Isaac and his acquisitions. Says <laughs> <laughs> I can get any. I man says can get any game board game he wants. Still goes out and buys board games. <laughs> <Kind Yeah. of. laughs> it's funny. Um, if people want to keep an eye on what you're doing in the future, um, where can we find you on the interweb nets? Um, um, Twitter is probably the best place to find me. I'm uh, yeah. mice underscore guy on Twitter. Um, I'm the mice guy. <laughs> and... and um, you know, we're really approachable uh, on our Plat Hat Games website. We have all of our contact yeah. information under our contacts yeah. tab on our Plat Hat Games website. So anybody who wants to 
contact one of us can just send us an email directly to us. I uh, answer all my emails. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so anybody, anybody who wants to reach out and has anything that they want to talk about, um, I, I love chit chatting with people. I'm a people Especially person. Especially if you build, build Jerry up as well. If you're going to say, just <laughs> tell <laughs> Just say hello. Just say hello, wonderful. You know, comp- <laughs> compliment him on what he's wearing. You know, he's got the weekend coming up here. You know, make him feel, make him feel, make him feel loved. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we'll put, um, we'll put links. Obviously, we'll put the links in too for Coma Knots as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Plat Hat Games, we'll put that there. Your Twitter, will put that all on the on the show notes so that we've got kind of notes to show. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on. Pleasure. It's been a pleasure it's been having really me. Interesting chat. Um, for everybody out there who wants to keep an eye on what we're up to, go to the Googles, search We're Not Wizards. You'll find us on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and our website. Um, all these wonderful places um if you like what you've listened to tonight um you can find us on all of the normal podcast catchers your stitchers your speakers your acasts your googles your spotify's anywhere where you get your kind of your podcast of choice if you like what you've listened to tonight um then you can do two things first of all maybe tell somebody else you know anybody that's a big fan of uh, of jerry's work then mention He's been on here, this here podcast. The other thing you can do is you can go into Apple Podcasts and you can drop us a subscription, you can drop us a rating, you can drop us a review. If you are going to give us a rating or review, don't give us 10 stars because it makes us big-headed. But don't give us one star because it makes us cry. Give us um, something in the middle, like a five, because it's average and we're just uh, a little bit average. <laughs> but, the person who's not, <laughs> but the person who's not been average tonight is rather wonderful. Rather fantastic. His royal miceness, <laughs> heir to the throne of cheese, the man of dreams. Don't Mr. let him Jerry lie to you. I'm average. Just, <laughs> he's definitely a six. Um, <laughs> it's Mr. Jerry Hoffman. Thank you very much again for Thank coming you. on. Um, there's really two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Jerry? No. No, you're the mice guy, so I mean you can't be, you know. What is what is cards against wizard. humanity? What does that card say? We're we're sorcerers, yes. <laughs> we're... Don't, let's let's not finish this on a sour <laughs> note. Um, <laughs> and the and the second thing, second thing is to say goodbye. So it's a goodbye from Jerry. Say goodbye, Jerry. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. And um, I said this about Isaacs. Just go and check out Jerry's stuff because I've got Mice and Mystics and it's fantastic. And Andy Lewis from Polyhedron Collider says Stuff Fables is fantastic. And we're all going to be looking at the Coma Knots because it sounds fantastic. <laughs> but until the next time, goodbye. <laughs> Wizard is never late. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to. <laughs>